Greetings in the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord to each of you. It is a blessing to be here one more time. We are grateful. God has allowed us another privilege to come to where uh, you are hearing our voice today. We are thankful for all the things that God has done for us and for the things that he is going to do. God has continued uh, throughout this pandemic to uh, to bless his people. Uh, we've talked, man, about those uh, children of Israel that were living in the land of Goshen and how God protected them from most of the ten plagues. Yes, there were, were a couple that um, affected them as well to let them know that, that God is, is yet with us. Uh, and there are some things that we do go through, uh, such as, as the, the frogs. Uh, the frogs uh, were one of the ten plagues that affected the uh, children of Israel as well. Amen. Um, we're going to pray, and then we're going to get into our lesson today. The title for our lesson today is Getting to Know Your God. Personally, you need to get to know your God. Let us begin with prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, we want to thank you for yet another day. For this is the day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. We are thankful for our life, health, and strength. We are thankful for having a roof over our head, food to eat, water to drink, we're grateful, Lord Jesus, that the plans of the enemy have come to naught and that we are still standing. Father, for those that are being affected by COVID-19, we continue to pray their strength in you, that God, you will continue to cover them with your blood. Father, we ask that you would just touch those that are sick and afflicted. God, you are a doctor that has never lost a case. Father, you are a lawyer that has never lost a case. And so today, Father, we ask you to look upon us today and have mercy upon us. Father, we ask that you would forgive us of all of our sins, the sins of commission and the sins of omission. We ask you, Lord Jesus, to make us vessels of honor. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you do a new thing in uh, this generation. Do a new thing in, nine, in 2000, rather, 20. Father, and we pray that you get all the glory and all the honor and praise will be yours. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So we ask God to bless us uh, with the lesson that we have for you this evening. Amen. And we're going to be looking at uh, a few verses of scripture tonight uh, found in Exodus chapter number 33 and that is the primary one that we will, we will be looking at also Exodus chapter number 34 Exodus 33 and Exodus 34 um, now uh, we have been uh, talking uh, about um, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Uh, last week in our discussion in Bible study, we talked about that we needed to take courage. And at that time, we were talking about uh, Joshua and um, how uh, God uh, was using him and how it was up to him to move forward after the death of Moses and how that God had made a promise that, that God would be with him as he was with Moses. Now it's important for us to understand that every generation must know God for themselves. And so what we find, amen, as we think on this wise, that when we look at uh, generational gaps, uh, each generation, which is about 40 years between each generation, 
each generation uh, typically sees uh, God differently, or we see one another differently. We respond differently. Uh, those that are older, we see those that are younger than us, and we say, in my day, this wouldn't be this way or I don't understand them. And the reasoning that we don't understand one another is simply because of the generational gap. And a part of the problem has been that we have not um, fully uh, shared with the next generation about life and about our God. And thus, uh, we find that people are, have the tendency to move more in the culture in which they have been engulfed with, and it becomes a little more difficult for them to see uh, the God that you and I serve. It is not impossible, but I will say this, the Bible uh, tells us that every generation wax worse and worse as it relates to um, the Lord. Um, but what we must always take courage in is, is that when Christ comes back, he is not going to be coming back uh, as in the book of Revelation refers to as a lukewarm church but he's coming back with a Philadelphia church, a church that is full of power. And so I believe that in the days that are to come, there's going to be a great awakening, amen, as the world has never seen, that there's going to be a great awakening, uh, uh, a spiritual awakening, and that we will see uh, the move of God in a way that, that we have not seen it before. But it's important that each of us know God for ourselves. I think oftentimes about um, where I came from and the things that I learned uh, at the hands of some wonderful people of God. I, I exalt, in a way, um, my, my mother and father in the gospel, Bishop Lewis Osborne Sr. and Bishop Grace Osborne. I believe that they uh, uh, were, of course, she's still living and she's a, still a, a powerful woman of God. And I learned a lot from them. But in that day, uh, as we were growing up, uh, there were a lot of things that we were not to do. And in those days, they believed that those things, uh, or they taught that those things were, were perhaps not, not um, lawful um, when it comes to God, things uh, such as uh, how we dressed, um, and I'm not talking about things that are modest, but you know, things that were, were not modest, um, our hairdos, how they were, if they reflected the world, uh, we, we were not to go to uh, things such as the movies, movie theaters, we were not to um, to gamble, we were not to drink any alcoholic beverages, we were uh, not to smoke cigarettes, and certainly we were not to do uh, illicit drugs. Things along those natures, and of course the regular stuff as uh, fornication and adultery and that kind of thing. But uh, specifically those, those things uh, were, were taught and uh, as time uh, went on, we, we learned more um, that there are some things that uh, are not uh, specifically um, not uh, lawful or, 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 or against God. But I want to say this, um, I am grateful uh, for um, the issues or the not the issues, but the teaching that we had in those days because it made me who I am today. So it couldn't have been all bad, even though it may not have been quite 
scriptural, it was enough to keep me from a lot of things that I could have found myself in today. So I'm grateful for my past. I'm grateful uh, for knowing God in the way that I know him now. And we must all know our God for ourselves. And how does this happen? This occurs through circumstances. It occurs through issues that come in our life where God has an opportunity to show himself up in you. Were you able to learn about his goodness, his kindness? Were you able to learn about discipline? Were we able to learn about long suffering? Were we able to learn even about how to deal with things such as depression and oppression and how to deal with a lost loved one, whether they, they, they died by, um, you know, a car accident or, or died by some disease, or if, if the marriage died, or if a relationship that, that you took a lot of stock in ended. All of these things God uses to show himself to you who he is and how he is your God. And I trust that um, as we delve into this tonight that you will learn more about your God. And the more you learn about him, the more, amen, you will fall in love with him. Thank God that this is one more day that we're walking on the topsoil. I hadn't said that yet, so I want to say that again. I thank God for one more day for walking on the topsoil and another day to get things right. All right, let's delve in, into the lesson. Uh, as we said, we, we've spoken on the subject, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And as we have talked for the last uh, two Sundays, we learn that he is my God. And as you put in the God of Abraham, the God of J Isaac, the God of Jacob, you can now insert the God and you can put your name, the God of George McCree. And um, it's important for us to recognize that this occurs because of the uniqueness that God has placed in you. There's nobody like you. And so when God deals with you, he doesn't deal with you in a universal way. God deals with you as an individual because God knows you and he knows your strengths and he knows your weaknesses. He knows how much you can bear. And when things are happening in your life and you're saying, God, I don't, I don't get it. God, I don't feel this. Why is this happening? That's the time that you must learn to trust your God because God does not put anything more upon you than you are able to bear. So um, as we, we look at this, when God introduces himself, he shows us that we have a God who identifies with his relationship with you. God is one uh, who seeks a relationship with not perfect people, but with flawed people. He chose Israel because they were not a great nation, but they were a small nation. And he chose you not because you were so handsome and you were so beautiful, you were rich, you were wise and all these things. He chose you before you even came here, before the foundations of the world, God had you on his mind. And God put forth a plan of how he was going to introduce himself to you. And so, some of you who are watching tonight are in an introduction phase where you're just getting to know your God. 
Others of you have, have known God for a little while, but we don't know him in his, in his fullness because every day we learn more about him. We learn about him through the scriptures. We learn about him through the word of God. And it, the Bible said, in his law doth we meditate day and night. We learn more about God. We learn about what he likes and what he doesn't like. But we also learn about the, the, the long um, suffering of God, the, the patience rather of God. We learn how he is able to, to hold us in his loving arms even when there is anger. God does not toss us aside. God holds us in the hollow of his hand even when we are not in the place that we ought to be. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. This God related to each of them in a unique way. These three men that, that is referred to um, in that phrase were entirely different. They had different personalities and, and came under dis different circumstances. Then on Sunday, we began to talk about Moses. And as we talked about God, Moses, we let you know that um, when God uh, introduced himself, when um, Moses uh, was on the backside of the desert, I believe it's about um, the, the first uh, uh, chapter of, of Exodus, second or third chapter. Uh, he says, he sees him, yeah, about the, the third chapter. He, Moses sees a bush that's on fire. Well, uh, it could have been done by a, a, a um, um, a, a lightning strike. So that's, that is not unusual that uh, you find something in the, in the desert on fire. But the interesting thing was that the fire that was burning the bush did not burn the bush up. The bush was not consumed. And so when he saw this, it drawed his attention there and he heard um, God speaking out of it. And he said that I um, am um, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and uh, of Jacob. And he tells him to take his, his sandals off for the ground that he was standing on was holy ground. So it's, it's here that um, he is introduced to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But let's think for a moment. There was no um, books that had been written about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So the things that were passed on uh, about God had been passed on from one person to the other. That's, that's how they communicated. But there was no uh, written um, Pentateuch. There was no written Torah. How do we know that there was no written Torah at that time? Guess what? The Torah was written by Moses. What is the Torah? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, the first five books of the Bible. We'll, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this uh, in a moment, but I want you to see that when uh, God speaks to Moses, he speaks to him about something that he really doesn't know about. And so God has now to reveal himself to him in a way that he could understand it. You got to remember that he was brought up um, in Egypt uh, in the house of Pharaoh and, and his, his upbringing, his teaching, 
his education had all been uh, from uh, the Egyptians. So he knew about all of their different gods and goddesses. He knew uh, that there was a difference between um, the, the, the Egyptians and the Israelites. First part of his life, he thought he was an Israelite. Uh, he was, excuse me, a, 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 um, an Egyptian because he did not know. Even though the person that was, that was um, working with him was his own mother. And so certainly I'm sure that, that, that mom would share with him about uh, what it was like to be an Israelite and perhaps teach him a little bit about what she knew. But of course, he did not know that he himself was one. So I'm saying all that to say that, that here is um, a man um, who um, has not known this God. Now we're talking tonight about getting to know your God. And so Moses did not know this God, and this God is now telling him, I've got a job for you. He's hearing a voice out of a bush, and it's telling him that I've heard the cry of the children of Israel, and I've come to set them free. And I'm going to use you as a mouthpiece for me to go to Pharaoh to tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Certainly, um, this had to be um, uh, challenging for him uh, for a few reasons. Uh, number one, because um, he had killed an Egyptian. Um, this was 40 years earlier. Uh, there may have been a, been a bounty on his head. I don't know. Uh, but he knew that him going back, there may be consequences. Uh, so here he, he is hearing a voice that is telling him uh, to go uh, and um, tell Pharaoh to let the people of God go. And he asks a question. He says, well, listen, I'm going to go to these folk. Who uh, should I tell them is sending me? And he said, I am that I am. I will be whatever you need me to be. Now let's 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 focus in. This is this is this is a lesson today. Let's focus in and let's put ourselves in the places of some of these uh, children of Israel. They have been in bondage for 400 and some odd years. When they're released, it's been 430 years. So for many many generations, they have been enslaved. For many generations, things got worse. So you could say every generation was getting worse and worse and worse. The, the taskmasters were becoming harder. They were making life more miserable for them. And if there were those who had talked about this God, Jehovah, they're looking for him because the scripture does tell them that that they had cried out, man, for help, but there was silence for 400 years. And so now, here comes uh, a man who says, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob has sent me, and he's going to deliver you. I think, personally, if I had been in the shoes of one of those that were slaves, I probably would have had a few questions myself. I probably would not have been quick to, to uh, listen to someone who is saying that. <laughs> well, God then has to be the God of the Israelites. He first has to convince Moses 
He says, I'm not sure that I'm the one. He says, yeah, you're the one. And he says, what do you have in your hand? And so the scripture tells us that, that Moses had a rod in his hand. And when he had the rod in his hand, the Lord tells him to cast it down. Moses cast it down and it becomes a serpent. It's important it was a serpent because that was one of the, one of the, the, the gods of, of, of the Egyptians, something that he was familiar with. And he knew that, that the snakes of Egypt were poisonous. So he jumped back. And the scripture uh, says, he says, okay, now take it up by its tail um, again. So now this God who has changed this rod into a snake now tells him to pick it up. Not by the head where the poison is in, but by the tail. He does so, he obeys, it turns back into a rod. I don't know about you, but I think I would have been suspicious of that rod from that day forward. I'm not sure I would, would have been putting it by my side, you know, <laughs> thinking that maybe that thing would turn back into a, a snake. He's still not too convinced, and so he tells him to put his hand into his, where his stomach is. He pulls it out, and it was white as leprosy. He knows what leprosy is about because he has witnessed it. Later on, you find uh, where his, his sister Miriam uh, is struck with leprosy. So he knew about that, and, his, and leprosy was something that would kill you if not cured. The scripture goes on to say that he tells him to put his hand back in there again. He pulls it out, and it's back to normal. And so he understands it, that this is, a, this is an awesome God that I have heard someone talk about, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. So now he must convince another generation, a generation that knows not God. These, uh, this generation uh, had been influenced uh, by uh, Egypt, the culture of Egypt, the philosophies of Egypt, and to them, as I said Sunday, this Jehovah was either an absentee father or a powerless God because nothing had been done for them that they could see with their own eyes, hear with their own ears. Certainly, uh, God was with them. You see, when we recognize uh, uh, God is with us every day. When the sun comes up every day, that shows God is with us. When he sends the rain and the sunshine, God is with us. But all the times we want, we want to see, see something special, something extraordinary. Uh, so God shows them um, through the ten plagues that were, were coming that he was the, their God. So the ten plagues were twofold. It was to introduce the children of Israel to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and was also to send a message to the Egyptians. I am their God, and when you mess with them, you mess with me. Let them go. So what does, was he, what does he do? Um, we talked uh, Sunday about that there were 10 plagues that came, and each of these plagues um, was, was in direct defiance of the Egyptian gods. Plague number one, the Egyptian was the Egyptian god of the Nile River. So what does God do? He turns the water into uh, blood. Acts, uh, excuse me, the seventh chapter, verse 11, 
verse 14, excuse me, through 25. The second plague came against the goddess of the frogs when man, uh, uh, God, Jehovah, uh, brings forth frogs and, and sends them in every place. But this was one that man, the ma magicians were able, able to duplicate that. Your God can do that. Our God can do it too. So in um, the 8th chapter, verses uh, 1 through 15, we find that the frogs were everywhere and it was also in the land of Goshen. But you can't uh, compare yourself to our God. The third one, Jehovah comes against the God of the earth and sends forth lice. Chapter 8, verse 16 through 19. Fourth plague, he goes against the God of the flies. And he produces flies everywhere. Chapter 8, verse 20 through, 20 through 32. Then there were four gods uh, of the bulls and goats, the fifth plague. So Jehovah sends a disease on, on the cattle. Chapter 9, verse 1 through 7. Following that, we have a few gods um, of uh, the atmosphere. Um, excuse me, I, I skipped one. The sixth one was the goddess of epidemics. Interesting, isn't it? Goddess of epidemics and boils are, are everywhere. On, on everybody. Chapter 9, verse 8 through 12. Now, as for me, uh, by the first one, I think I would have said uncle. And I would have said, okay, I'll let him go. But God, the scripture says God hardened Pharaoh's heart. So why does God harden his, his heart? Because remember, uh, the plagues were twofold. He had to show the children of Israel how awesome, how powerful he was. So God hardens Pharaoh's heart so that another plague can come forth. So the seventh plague was the gods of the atmosphere. And so God in chapter 9, verse 13 through 35, God sends a hailstorm. And the storm, the, the, the hell is so big that it's destroying everything on the ground. The eighth plague was the Egyptian uh, deity protector from locusts. And in chapter 10, verses 1 through 20, our God steps in and, and causes the, the deity that was to protect them was not able to protect them. But over in the land of Goshen, amen, their God was their protector. You see, remember, the children of, of Israel had been inundated by, by their culture, the Egyptian culture, the Egyptian gods. So certainly they knew all about, about all of these gods. So God is, is constantly trying to put into their heads and cause it to go from their, their heads 18 inches to their heart until they knew that they served a mighty God. Then the ninth um, plague was the God of the sun and the moon God. And what does, what does Jehovah do? He brings forth darkness everywhere but there was a light in the land of Goshen. They had light. I hear the song uh, saying, there shall be light in the evening time. The path to glory you shall surely find. Through the waterway there is a light today buried in the precious name, his name, 
So young and old, repent of all your sins and let the Holy Ghost, uh, I'm sorry, so young and old, repent of all your sins and the Holy Ghost will enter in. There we go. The evening time has come. It's a fact that God and Christ are one. Yeah, that's it. All right, uh, number 10 was for all the gods and God says, all right, I'm, I'm done with this stuff. Uh, I'm going to show everybody just how powerful I am and how selective I can be. So he says that he is going to uh, take out of, out of every one of them, all of the Egyptians, he was going to take the firstborn. Now that's interesting because that was very selective because if you were, if, think even if you were twins, here you got twins, but the first one that came out was the one that died. How uh, awesome and amazing that is that God, even when the death angel came, they knew who was first. Isn't that something? The Bible says that, that the very uh, hair on your head are numbered. God knows so much about you. He, 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 he wants a relationship with each of us individually. God wants to have a relationship with you. So you remember the story that, that, that God says, uh, well, Pharaoh uh, finally says, well, I'll, okay, I'm going to let them go. And so he let them go. But after they left, they had been gone. Pharaoh started thinking, man, I don't like what went down here. And so the scripture says that Pharaoh got a hold of, of his, his, his commanders of his army and said, we are going after them and we're going to bring them back. Perhaps he began to think about his, 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 his economy and how it was all the, 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 the Israelites that were holding things, their economy up because they were slaves and they were doing all of this work for little of nothing. Perhaps that was the reason why he decided to risk going against this God. But nevertheless, he did. And you will remember the story when they got to the Red Sea that there were those who were able to look and to see that Pharaoh and his host, uh, his, his army, his vast army, was coming against him. And so um, they were fearful because they were boxed in. There's a mountain on the left of them. There's a mountain on the right of them. The enemy is behind them and they know that, that they are, are not going to be kind when they show up, that there is going to be a battle, there's going to be death. But what's before them is the Red Sea. Well, the Lord spoke to Moses and told him, just what to do. Let me say to this to someone tonight who's, who's watching that it may look on every side that, that uh, there is no way out of the situation that you find yourself in. But today I say to you that the more you know about your God, the more you'll know that he's a God that'll make a way out of no way. So the Bible says he told, God told Moses to stretch forth that rod. When he stretched forth that rod, the Bible says that, that, the, that the, the sea opened up. Now, um, uh, it, it's interesting. Um, when it opened up, some say that it opened up um, about a half a mile wide when the Red Sea opened up. And they had to travel through the Red Sea uh, from 11 to 12, excuse me, 11 to 13 miles. That's how far 
in the sea that they had to go. Now, I, I was thinking about this because, uh, you know, sometimes when we watch television and we see the movies, we see um, uh, the, the ocean or, or the river, excuse me, the, the sea opening up and they're walking through on dry ground, but it's, it's, it's level. But I want you to think about it. When you, what you've learned about the ocean and about seas, even about lakes, is, is that, that at the bottom there are crevices. It, it, it's got hills and, and, and valleys in a man uh, at the bottom of the ocean. There are places that are deeper than others. So when the water has, has parted away, they're walking on dry land, but they still have a, a rough path to go. Think about it. And I, I had never thought on, along these lines before. Um, so they had to travel, and their path had to be uh, still rough. It wasn't just a, 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 uh, a flat surface that they were walking on. I think about this, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm saying this because um, it took faith for them to go in uh, where the, the waters were stacked up on each side. But I want you to know that, that as you're walking through to the other side, even when you're walking in faith, I want you to understand that there are still pockets, there are still hills and valleys, even in your faith. Uh, think about this. I heard, heard the, the, the one man uh, who came to, to, to Jesus and says, Jesus, you know, my son, please heal my son. And he said, Lord, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. So even in our walk with God, thank you, Lord, even in uh, our, when we're having faith in God, there are some valleys that you must go through. There are, are some mountains in your faith. There are sometimes you you saying, Lord, I, 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 I believe you for this healing. I believe you for this healing. And yet there is a pain. There's a, there, there is a hill that you've got to climb. Uh, you, 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 you believe in God to heal you, but yet you're still feeling, you still have to climb that, that physical, that medical mountain, even though you have faith, you still must go through. Some of you have been going through, I, this, this seems now, now seem like it's, it's going into a message here. Some of you ha, ha, have been experiencing, you know, difficulties financially. You continue to believe God, you continue to have faith in Him, you continue to pay your tithe and your, give your offerings, you continue to do this, amen, even though you see the mountain of bills, even though you're hearing the call from the creditor, even though you don't know what tomorrow is going to bring, if you're going to get that job, if you're going to get that promotion, those are the hills and the valleys in, amen, your Red Sea. You still, you've got faith because you're walking in it. You got faith because you can see, man, the, the water that is on each side. You can see it, but yet you still got to walk it. The Bible talks about that we walk by faith. We walk by faith. That, what that means then is, is that we've got to climb those mountains that we see. We've got to climb them by faith. We got to still move, amen, when, we, when we're, we're feeling, sometimes, brothers and sisters, myself, sometimes I, I, I'm weak in my body or I don't have energy, but something in me says I got to continue to go forward. Faith says that I've got to, but before I'm going to make it to the other side, before I'm going to get, amen, that 11 or 13 miles, before I'm able to make it to the other side and I see my enemies that are thrown, that drown in the Red Sea. When the enemies drowned in the Red Sea, that meant that 
they, they, complete healing took place. They weren't coming back. You understand? They weren't coming back. But as they are going through, they still have it in mind that, that the enemy is behind me. They still have it in mind that I got I to gotta hurdle over, over these, these things that are before me as I'm in this bubble, as I'm, I'm going through, amen, this sea experience. You've got to know your God. Know that he that hath begun a good work in you is able to perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. God can perform it. God can get you to the other side of the Red Sea. And they had to know God. So what God does is God gives them that information. He, he, he allows them to, to see the plagues and how God was victorious in the plagues. And that's what God has done. All you've got to do, brothers and sisters, is look back over your life. Look back to what God has already done in your life. You've got a testimony. And that testimony now, amen, becomes the faith that you need for what you're going through today. What you've gone through before the things that the enemy desired to do to you, and some of the things that he did do to you, but yet you survived. That should tell you that God is with you and you know your God. Man, the Bible said, them that know their God shall be strong. Them that know your God, amen, are, are not weak in your faith. Them that know your God knows that I don't know how he's going to do it, but I know that if he said it, that settles it. Them that know their God shall be strong and shall do exploits. There are going to be some things that you're going to do, you, 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 things that you're going to do because, amen, you know your God. And because you are learning more about your God, you see, God already knows you. God already knows your down sittings and your uprisings. God already knows your capabilities. God already knows every weakness that you have. God already knows all of the struggles that you have. God already knows what, what your limitations are. And because God knows that, he can trust you. He can trust that when you get to your limitations, that he knows that you're going to allow him to take the forefront. Amen. That's the end, end, end of a message, I'm, and I'm going back to the lesson. Praise the Lord. God uh, had to reveal to Moses who he was. Now, I want you to, you, you to look at Exodus. I, I uh, uh, have 11 minutes. Exodus chapter number 33, um, this is how uh, uh, Moses learned about his God. It was during the journey he learned more about God. As he went through the journey, he spent time in the tabernacle. And Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it. Uh, this is Exodus chapter 33, verse 7 through 11. Moses took the tabernacle and pitched it without the temple, far off from the camp. And it came to pass, verse 8, when Moses uh, went, in, went unto the tabernacle, and all the people rose up and stood every man at his, at his tent door and looked after Moses, saw where he went, until he had gone into the tabernacle. Remember the tabernacle uh, was the tent of, of, of fellowship, the, temp, the tent of meeting. This is where Moses would meet with God. And it came to pass as Moses entered into the temp tabernacle, the cloudy pillar descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle. And the Lord talked with Moses. I say to you today that for you to know your God, you need to have time that you spend one-on-one -on -one with your God. You spend it one-on-one -on -one with him in prayer, in meditation. You spend it one-on-one -on -one with God. When you pray your part, you stop and you listen 
to hear what God wants to say to you. And it's amazing, when you begin to pick up this, this book, this Bible, God will begin to talk to you and the word man uh, becomes a rhema word. It is transformed from a logos word to a rhema word, a teller, tailor made word for you and your situation. And it came to pass as Moses entered into the temple that the cloud descended and stood at the door of the tabernacle and Moses and the Lord talked. And all the people saw the pillar standing at, at the tab tabernacle door. And what did they do? They rose up and worshiped every man in his tent door. And Moses and the Lord spake unto Moses face to face as a man speaketh unto his friend. And he turned again to the camp, but his servant Moses, the son of Nun, a young man, departed not out of the tabernacle. We've talked about that before. L lesson being, if you want to get ahead, stay behind. Joshua, though Moses left the tabernacle, Joshua said, I want a piece of this, and he stayed behind. Now, Moses' knowledge of God was extremely limited. This was before. As I said, uh, there were no documents to undergird his faith. The Torah and the Pentateuch had not yet been written. How do we know this? Because Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. Now, how in the world could Moses write Genesis, he wasn't there. He could write Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, but how in the world could he write about God and creation? How could he write about the fall of Adam? How could he write about Noah and the ark? How could he write about Sodom and Gomorrah? How could he write about the things that happened when he called Abram and told him to go to a land in which he was going to show him? How could he write a, a, about his becoming Abraham and, and his wife Sarai becoming Sarah? How could he write about, about Isaac and, and Isaac's wife, Rebekah? How could he write about Jacob and Jacob's wives and, and Jacob's name being changed to Israel. How could he write about all that? I'm glad you asked. Looking again at chapter number 33. Verse number 13 says, Now therefore I pray thee, if I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way that I may know thee. <laughs> he wanted to know God for himself. That I may find grace in thy sight and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said, my presence shall go with thee and I will give thee rest. Now remember that he already had a relationship with God to the extent where God would speak to him face to face, but it was in a cloud. He never literally saw his face. But notice what he says. Uh, the Lord says, uh, no, verse number, number 16. For wherein shall, I, I, shall it be known here that I and thy, thy people have found grace in thy sight? Is it not? that thou goest with us? Or shall we be separated, I and thy people, from all the people that are upon the face of the earth? And the Lord said, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken. For thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. and I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee and will be gracious to whom I will be gracious 
and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. And he said, Thou canst not see my face, for there shall no man see me and live. And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me, and thou shalt stand upon a rock, and it shall come to pass while my glory passeth by that I will put thee in the cleft of the rock and will cover thee with mine hand while I pass by. And I will take away mine hand and thou shalt see my back part, but my face shall not be seen. This is where God shows him his hind part. He shows him the past. And it is at this time where God allows him to be man in the cleft of a rock. And God uh, puts his hands over his eyes so he can't peek. He puts his hands over his eyes so that he passes by. So he doesn't see his face. But what he sees is what he has done. And so here... Uh, Moses is able to see in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth and, and the earth was without form and void and God, darkness was upon the face of the deep and the spirit of the Lord moved upon the face of the waters and God said let there be light and there was light. It was there where he saw the, amen, uh, the Garden of Eden. It was there he saw, amen, Adam being formed from the dust of the earth. It was there he saw Eve coming out of a man, his side. He began to see everything and God allowed him to write it down in the, the Torah, in the Pentateuch. He was able to write these. I mean, I, I guess that's also why it, it, it took them a while to get from uh, uh, Egypt from in the wilderness to get to Canaan because God was doing a work on Moses. Not only was God doing a work on Moses, God was doing a work on the people of God. God was showing them, I am with you. He became a pillar of fire by night and a pillar of cloud by day. These, this generation began to see God at work and I am out of time amen but I'm not out of thought they begin to see God and this generation they are seeing a man of uh, the the epidemic amen this generation is seeing so many things and I guess we're just gonna have to deal with this a little more next week it is this generation that is seeing these things that are coming but notice the past. Moses gave, gave uh, God gave Moses a look at the past and said, the same God that took care of them will take care of you. We're out of time. Amen. We trust you got something out of the lesson tonight. You make it up in your mind that you want to know God for yourself. It's good that your mama knows him. It's good that grandma knows them, nana knows them, mother dear knows them, amen, big daddy knows them, or whatever you call your grandparents, your, your, your mother, your father, and the gospel, all these folks that, that know, that knew him or know him, but you need to know him for yourself. Father, we thank you, God, for this day. We thank you for all who have heard this lesson on tonight. Father, we want to know you in a more special way. We want to know you, Lord Jesus, in the things that you have done. And Lord, that the same God that was with my mom and my dad, the same God that, that has been with those that we, we read about in the Bible, you are the same God today. And the same power that you possess then, you possess now. Now, Father, I pray that you enrich your people 
with your word, enrich them, empower them with your spirit, that we may be the men and the women that you need in these last and evil days. Bless us tonight, and we will be blessed. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you, and we'll look forward to seeing you uh, on Sunday.